and uh, Dr. Bekenau is a professor of small animals in general medicine, College of Veterinary Medicine in North Carolina State University, and he has widely published on tick-borne diseases. So please, Adam. Dr. Buchenauer, would you mind turning on your video, please? I think I did. Is it okay. not on? You're, it's on now, yeah. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate the invitation to this uh, interesting um, conference. And hopefully we'll give you a little bit of perspective of what's going on in the veterinary world about uh, canine babesiosis. So just an overview of the things that we're going to cover, kind of some of the history of canine babesiosis, which will fortunately or unfortunately for you all include some of my life story. Um, what, what do we know now and, and where are we headed next? I am fortunate to have been named the Andy Quattlebaum uh, Distinguished Chair of Infectious Disease Research at North Carolina State. Um, and the purpose of this uh, endowed chair aligns very, very well with my own personal goals um, as a veterinary internist uh, clinician is uh, everything I'm doing is to advance our understanding of infectious diseases for dogs and cats. Um, and my primary goals, full disclosure, are to help dogs and cats. Um, I really don't know anything about human babesiosis that much, although I have, I've learned a little bit. So this might just be uh, doggy doctor story time for you all. But I think we actually have some interesting insights in the veterinary world that I think people should probably be on the lookout for um, in human babesiosis. So this is me, I identify as a dog person um, and pit bulls are my favorite kinds of dogs. That's, they've been in my life since I was a young person. That was my first dog. Um, I am married to a um, high functioning crazy cat lady. So I always have cats in my life and um, I enjoy working with cats and we've done a fair amount um, working on uh, helping diseases of dogs and cats. I saw the comment in the chat about the echo. Um, is everyone experiencing that? Can I get any thumbs up from at least from, it's good? It's okay in my end, um, so not sure why. Okay, thank you, uh, Gordana, I appreciate that. But this, <laughs> you know, my story of doing infectious diseases, um, really started with Babesia. Um, Babesia has been around and is one of the oldest known uh, vector-borne infections. Uh, canine babesiosis was probably first described clinically back in the 1800s um, during a time when folks from uh, Great Britain were uh, going to South Africa and there's a series of letters written from some of the uh, colonial individuals, um, and they specifically mention that every dog that they brought from Great Britain died of this biliary fever um, when they went to South Africa, um, except for just one dog. And what they were likely describing at that point in time was a very severe and virulent form of canine babesiosis, which does seem to be primarily geographically limited to South Africa called Babesia canis rossi. Um, it took a while before we actually started finding things. In veterinary school, when I went to veterinary school, I imagine like, <laughs> I, know, I got probably two slides about babesiosis, canine babesiosis in veterinary school. That may be two slides more than you got about babesiosis in medical school. Um, but they basically taught me, hey, it's a tick transmitted infection. Um, it's a protozoan parasite that is primarily infects the red blood cells. That's literally what I got. Um, almost with a hint of, you're probably not going to see this particular infection. 
We typically associate it as it lives in the red blood cells in the vertebrate host. Um, classic signs of babesiosis in most species is associated with anemia. Frequently, it's hemolytic. Um, in dogs, it's fairly well documented to have some immune-mediated components uh, modulated by IgM, IgG complements. So some of them are Coombs positive, um, and they mimic an autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So classic signs that we would be looking for are regenerative anemias, fever, et cetera. This is what I was taught. Literally, when we started, if it was a big Babesia. So here you can see in the pictures, this is a large form Babesia. These are canine red blood cells. They're about nine microns across. And you can see that these parasites spread approximately a third to a half of the width of those erythrocytes. So that was a large form Babesia. It was called Babesia canis because it was in dogs. Um, and then I was taught about this other species, Babesia gibsoni, which was a small form of Babesia but I was immediately taught, don't worry about that. That infection doesn't exist in the United States. Um, that was the extent of my uh, parasitology training regarding Babesia uh, in uh, veterinary school. My very first day <laughs> as a veterinarian, as an intern, um, I came to North Carolina State and they basically asked me, do you want to see the cat or do you want to see the pit bull? Um, which case do you want? Being a dog person as who loves pit bulls, I said, please, I'll take the pit bull. Um, so that's what I looked like then. <laughs> and this is kind of what the pit bull looked like. Um, it was a, a, a rough looking pit bull that had some scars, um, had obviously been in several fights in its life. Um, and was severely anemic um, in our intensive care unit, um, had a hematocrit in the teens um, or a piece of pack cell volume in the teens, you know, requiring blood transfusions, et cetera. Uh, we sent blood smears off to the clinical pathology lab. Our clinical pathology technicians called me immediately and they were so shocked and amazed. They were like, oh my goodness, this dog has a small Babesia, it has Babesia gibsoni. And so here I am, day one veterinarian who like three months ago was taught that this infection was not in existence and I didn't have to worry about it. Now my very first case as a clinician, uh, that's what I had in front of me. So, um, you know, once I wiped the tears away in the bathroom and recovered myself, I went and grabbed some textbooks and started trying to read about it and trying to understand to treat this dog. But literally, um, this dog changed my life, you know, not this dog, a dog like it changed my life. Um, at that point in time, you know, I barely knew what Babesia was. I did, wasn't the type of person I didn't think I liked. Uh, you know, I, we didn't have that infection here. I definitely was someone who was not interested in doing any research um, because I honestly didn't know what research was at the time. I thought research was uh, sitting at a bench pipetting and measuring things in a volumetric flask. Um, so even though I didn't like research, this dog generated a lot of questions for me. Like, how, how is this infection here? How many other dogs have this infection that's not supposed to be here in this country? How is it being transmitted? Um, how do we diagnose it? How do we treat it? And so on. And ultimately, of course, I've come to realize that that's what research is. Research is simply asking questions um, that we don't have the answers to or finding so better solutions for problems uh, that we currently feel are inadequate. So everything could have ended there because I didn't like research, but um, at NC State, I happened to have stumbled upon one of these great training programs and this gentleman um, on the left side of the screen is Dr. Edward Breitschwert. Um, he is a veterinary internist. Um, I've already heard his name mentioned many times during this conference. He's done a lot of work regarding uh, bartonellosis in animals and in people. Um, 
to be honest, he wasn't that interested in Fabizia. Um, but since I wasn't going to work on Bartonella, he decided to allow me to do a PhD in his lab studying Fabizia. Uh, this other gentleman um, is Mike Levy. Um, he is a parasitologist. And um, as part of his graduate work, um, he was one of the very first individuals to be involved with culturing Babesia species in vitro um, with the micro aerophilic stationary phase culture. So um, as so many things happen in life, it's a matter of a little bit of luck um, and seizing an opportunity. I, I was fortunate to have um, excellent mentorship that then allowed me to answer some of the questions that we wanted to answer. And, and like I said, it almost didn't happen. I didn't like research. So even though I saw this dog in 1995, it took me four years to write a, a silly case report reporting of uh, Babesia gibsoni infections. So we kind of did some uh, sero, serologic and molecular surveys. And ultimately, we ended up finding a cohort, a larger number of dogs infected with Babesia gibsoni in North Carolina. Um, and with you know a little prodding, Dr. Brightford finally got me to publish my first paper. Um, and then we kind of move forward. So I feel incredibly fortunate um, for the timing at which I became involved in protozoal research. Um, anybody know who this guy is? Type it in the chat, yell it out if you're live, I can't hear you, but um, this guy with the surfboard, his name is Kerry Mullis. Um, so he is credited as you know, one of the people who um, invented the polymerase chain reaction. Um, and clearly that was one of the most important developments uh, for advancing uh, molecular diagnostics and molecular research. Um, and I was fortunate that those techniques were now becoming more widely available, widely accessible uh, through TAC polymerase and as I was doing my graduate work, we were allowed, able to do a, a reasonable amount of the early uh, molecular work with canine Babesia. So really that molecular biology advancement really took us from this, you know, big, big Babesia, small Babesia um, and using a microscope. So this particular microscope is the microscope that was used by Kilborn and Smith um, when they were performing the first epidemiologic studies that demonstrated um, that Babesia was indeed chick transmitted. So, you know, bovine Babesiosis is acknowledged as being one of the first infections to document transmission of pathogens by ticks. Um, and one of those gentlemen was a veterinarian um, and they, uh, you know, this is the microscope they use to evaluate their blood smears to document infection. So we went from a hundred years of using a microscope to advancing to molecular techniques. Um, and currently there are at least 10 different genetically unique Babesia species that are capable of infecting dogs. Um, and I predict as we continue to look and our technology improves, the number of Babesia species that we have, that we know that infect <clears throat> dogs will continue to increase. Um, I think this is relevant for human medicine because right now in human medicine, I think people think about two to three species of Babesia that can infect dogs and, or they can infect humans, microti, um, and, and a couple of large forms of Babesia and some small forms that are from the Western United States. But there are thousands of Babesia species that are occurring on planet Earth. Um, and while they tend to mostly infect the species that they are um, co-evolved with, they will occasionally jump species um, and if you do not have the tools to find them, you're not probably going to find them. So the good news for canine Babesiosis in humans, um, even though there are a lot of species of Babesia that infect dogs, 
the evidence for any of these species infecting humans and being a zoonotic pathogen is incredibly small. Um, but I would never say never. And there will be, if there, well, there have been, let's be honest, there already have been other zoonotic transmissions of different Babesia species to humans that are either have been diagnosed or um, will be diagnosed in the future. Like mostly in splenectomized patients is what we see, but those splenectomized patients may just be the tip of the iceberg. So <laughs> this is back in the 90s. Um, one of the things that we found what was interesting is when we found our first Babesia gibsoni and we used PCR and sequencing to uh, identify the, um, the organisms, what we found was that the Babesia gibsoni that we found here in North Carolina didn't match the Babesia gibsoni sequences that were in GenBank, um, which led us to perform some studies, some of the earlier studies looking at ribosomal RNA, RNA sequences, um, where we basically figured out that what you see on a microscope may absolutely have no um, determination of what the genetic code is and what actual organism you're looking at. So um, we were able to figure out that there were at least three genetically distinct small pyroplasms or Babesia species from dogs. Um, and as one of my first endeavors, because we did not have um, good molecular techniques to identify these, um, you know, it sounds simple now, but we, you know, developed um, PCR tests to identify Babesias. And I think one of the most important decisions that we made at that time was our diagnostic algorithm was designed using a broad range platform. So we would typically ask the question, is there Babesia DNA in this patient's sample? Yes or no. Um, by designing primers, which would amplify a wide range of Babesia species, possibly even other gen genera like uh, Tylaria. And, and if we got a positive signal, then we would funnel down to individual uh, species specific tests, which would then identify which individual species present. Um, I think this is where there is an opportunity research and diagnostically in human medicine, because I think many of the assays are very specifically designed to target Babesia microti. Um, and you may, may be missing a wide range of organisms by simply running these techniques, we were able to identify um, novel and never before described Babesia species in dogs that if we did not have this broad range approach, we would have had false negative results on their PCR tests. So we were then able to use these techniques. We were figured out that pit bulls, interestingly, um, that the majority of Babesia gibsoni infections that we saw in American pit, in, in the United States, um, 75 to 90% of them were in pit bulls. Um, it did not interestingly seem as if though there was a true genetic predisposition. So we started asking why are these pit bulls becoming infected? Um, so we would go to kennels and we would collect blood samples from these dogs. Um, and unfortunately, this is the conditions under which many of these dogs were housed. Um, so these pit bulls, I will be honest, were amazing loving animals to, to me. I had never, during all of my research of bleeding, collecting blood samples from literally thousands of pit bulls, I can count on one hand the number of them that were mean to a human being, but many of them did not like other dogs and could be dog aggressive. And for that reason, um, they were frequently kept on a chain. Um, but what was interesting is if you took an energetic dog that wanted to be around, but it all it could do was be on a chain, what they did is they, they ran around in a circle all day long. Um, and basically what happened is these dogs lived in a 10 foot circle of dirt, you know, so there was nothing, there was no vegetation. 
um, that the dog could actually touch. And then they lived in a plastic or, or, a, or a wooden dog house and there were no, um, interestingly, when I went there, they had no ticks. Um, and at that point in time, I was not aware of, the, of, of anyone describing a 10 foot circle of dirt tick um, that was transmitting these infections. So what obviously came to mind was what other kind of lifestyle issues are these dogs having? Um, how could they be getting these infections? And this infection comes from Southeast Asia. Um, Babesia gibsoni has primarily and originally been described in Japan. Um, and what we eventually figured out was that in Japan, parts of Japan and other parts of Southeast Asia, unfortunately, dog fighting um, is socially acceptable and common practice. Um, so there are parts of Southeast Asia where it is normal for some people to go to the dog fights. Um, fortunately for us in the United States, um, we improved our humane treatment of animal laws. And in the 80s and 90s, dog fighting became a felony or a severe consequence punishment for having dog fighting. But what happened is we believe individuals um, because they did not want to get arrested in the United States. They were actually shipping dogs to Southeast Asia where they were fighting the dogs and then bringing them back to the United States. Um, and we believe that it was during these trips to Southeast Asia is where we had the first importation of Babesia gibsoni um, into the US. And I can tell you that's also happening in other parts of the world, um, including Europe, South America, and, and the continent of Africa, so um, we've seen similar findings. So we had a suspicion. Um, these dogs that were infected did not have ticks on them, but they were being exposed to other dogs, potentially through uh, biting. And we were trying to figure out, is this a bite wound transmission disease? And well, obviously we did not hold dog bites experimentally or otherwise to figure this question out. Um, when we went back and looked at our data, we looked at the dogs that we found that were infected with Babesia gibsoni. And you can see here that 90% of those dogs that with Babesia gibsoni were American pit bull terriers. Um, but you can see down here at the bottom, um, we would find like pit bull, pit bull, pit bull, pit bull, and then you would find Cocker Spaniel. Um, and I was not aware of anyone having an underground illegal Cocker Spaniel dog fighting rings, um, you know, and we said, well, what, how are these dogs? We, let's focus on these dogs that are not pit bulls that are um, becoming infected with babesiosis. And what we did is basically through some questionnaire-based research, we were able to determine that these dogs that were not pit bulls that were infected with Babesia, when questioned, the owner was able to tell us, interestingly, my dog had been in a, attacked by another dog at the dog park or at, you know on the street. And when we found out what that breed of dog was, those dogs had been attacked by a pit bull. Um, and so, we were able to develop circumstantial evidence, and this has been, again been documented through dogs that have scars, et cetera, that do direct dog-to-dog -dog transmission is, um, is, is occurring. So, you know, we learned a little bit. So now we knew what the infection was. It was Babesia gibsoni. We knew that at least in the U.S. and outside of Asia, it was primarily being found in American pit bull terriers. We were able to deduce how it was being transmitted. It is a tick transmitted disease. Um, the tick vector is are believed to primarily be Haemophysalis species, which occur in Southeast Asia, but have been imported to, to other parts of the world. The Asian longhorn tick is now endemic in the United States. Um, we had indirect evidence of direct dog to dog transmission through dog fights. Um, we have had a number of case series where we have found Babesia transmitted inadvertently by using 
uh, pit bulls as blood donors um, to save another dog that's having a, a, a hemolytic crisis or has a blood loss crisis. And then there's also importantly been good documentation of transplacental transmission of Babesia gibsoni. Some studies that were done actually quite a while ago, almost 50 years ago in Japan, um, they were able to document transplacental transmission. So interestingly, this tick transmitted infection in the United States is primarily transmitted direct dog to dog and transplacental. Um, we're never able yet, we've not yet been able to document um, tick transmission in the United States. So, okay, great news. We found this infection, it's all over the place. I know a little bit about how it's being transmitted, but at the time we started studying this infection, um, there were no treat treatments that were effective to clear this. So if you were a dog that had Babesia gibsoni, you had Babesia gibsoni for life. I could measure, I could check your blood every month for 10 years and you were still infected with Babesia gibsoni, oftentimes in a subclinical phase. So when we started, there were no treatments. Um, so, you know, very little research is truly novel. Um, in this scenario, I used humans as a model for animal disease. So during the time when we were studying this, we found some papers um, showing that atovaquone and azithromycin was effective for treating human babesiosis. This was some um, information uh, coming out of the Northeastern United States. I, I said, hey, let's try it in dogs. We did some pilot studies. We did a randomized placebo controlled trial. And ultimately, um, we went from having an infection that had a 0% cure rate to we had about 80% of the dogs being cured or clinically by having at least multiple serial PCR negative tests and an absence of clinical signs. So uh, we were very fortunate not only to find an infection, but hopefully be able to do something about it or find a way to do something about it. Um, we were able to, how much Babesia is out there? So a couple of things that you know, have been interesting. So I've always joked that you could have a career. Um, you could basically, if, if there was a Noah's Ark, you could go onto the ramp of Noah's Ark and bleed every animal two by two as they came through. And you would find at least one, if not two spe Babesia species in every single one of them. And in some ways we've done that. It started off the first thing we did was we found a new Babesia species in raccoons. We actually then found that 98% of raccoons are infected with Babesia. Um, we've built better mouse traps. We now target a combination of mitochondrial and ribosomal genes. Um, for improved sensitivity, we found these in otters. So semi-aquatic animals that you do not think about as having ticks are infected with a tick transmitted pathogen. Um, foxes, uh, hooved animals, ungulates, ox, maned wolves, um, rhinoceros, polar bears. Um, like I said, if you, if there is, if it has a spine, it can almost surely be infected with at least two different species of Babesia. Um, and we've been able to do that. And I do think that it is possible that these Babesia species have the opportunity or possibility to jump to humans. We started figuring out, are all of these dots the same? And what do they mean? Um, with the help of a very productive graduate student, Dr. Megan Schrieg, and a uh, Brian Wiegemann, we were able to really kind of do a little bit more to understand the phylogenetics of Babesia species um, and the pyroplasmids, which really fall into five clades. Most of our canine Babesia, our Babesia gibsoni is in this top clade, which is the Babesia sensu stricto clade. Um, some other clades include cytozoan and tyleria, which are related pyroplasms. Um, Tyleri equi, Babesia conradi is genetically similar to the Babesia WA1 parasite that's, or Babesia duncani that has been described in humans. Um, and then Babesia microti um, and Babesia microti-like species are probably ancestral to all of them. And I believe 
they will eventually be reclassified. They're probably not even a true Babesia species as they infect other cells, not just red blood cells. A characteristic, defining characteristic of true Babesia species is that the only cell they infect in the vertebrate host is a red blood cell. Um, and these will go into lymphocytes and macrophages. So um, at some point in time, some parasitologists will change the names to confuse us all. How much Babesia is out there in the world? Um, I was fortunate enough to, co to collaborate with a commercial diagnostic company um, who was running a larger number of tests than our diagnostic lab, so IDEX. Um, we looked at, at 102,000 samples from 48 different countries from six different regions of the world. Um, and these were not testing for all 10 Babesia species, but they were testing for the most common. And we found, not shockingly, that if you live on planet Earth and you have dogs, you have dogs that are infected with Babesia. So every region uh, that submitted samples had dogs test positive. Some of the dogs, some of the regions had high prevalence. The um, Asian Pacific region prevalence was over 10%. Um, North America had the highest number of tests, but the lowest prevalence. This probably reflects a difference in testing. Um, some places like Asia and Europe, they only test dogs that are 100% clinical and suspected to have Babesia, or maybe even they saw the blood smear and want to confirm molecularly. Whereas in North America, we take a more of approach that is often, can this dog have tick-borne disease? If so, we're going to test for a broad range of, of of pathogens. Um, first time I presented this, um, I got yelled at by some colleagues that I had, we had misdivided Northern and Southern Europe. Um, so I thought there were a few other ways that we could reclassify Europe as, based on uh, condiments, alcohol, and beverages, um, whether you thrive on the potato, the tomato, wine, beer, vodka, olive oil, butter, tea or coffee. Um, this is a heat map showing where we found Babesia. Um, and what I'll tell you about this, this kind of shows where we have dots, we have Babesia positives. I will tell you that continents like Africa, we only had three samples submitted during our testing period. So the absence of dots in continents actually represents an absence of samples submitted, not an absence of positives. So what you can see what I see when I look at this map is where we have a density of humans, um, we have a density of Babesia. Um, and Babesia gibsoni, which when I first started studying Babesia was supposedly limited to Southeast Asia, has now become the most commonly diagnosed species of Babesia in the world. Um, and has been found basically in every continent where we've looked at it, um, including Europe, South America, um, Asia. We have seen it in Africa, just not in this study. Babesia vogeli, which is another species transmitted by the brown dog tick, is also globally distributed, yet not quite as common as Babesia gibsoni. But we do occasionally see regional differences. Babesia canis, um, canis, is primarily found in Europe, um, transmitted by a dermacenter tick. Um, but we do occasionally still see cases in the US because um, you know, the world really is global and dogs can travel across um, international lines very easily. I'm gonna finish with a couple of cases quickly, um, just to give you some idea of some of the things that we deal with. So this is Bones, who's a 13-year-old malcastrated pit bull. Um, his owners noticed that his urine was dark colored, um, almost red in color, so representing either blood, hemoglobin, or myoglobin. Um, they thought the dog had a urinary tract infection and prescribed an antibiotic. The next day, the dog was weak and collapsing, so that it was not a urinary tract infection. The dog was anemic. Um, at this point in time, in the United States, if you're a veterinarian, if you see a pit bull with Babesia, hopefully you think about, uh, or you see a pit bull with anemia, you think about Babesia. That's what the, the veterinarian did. They saw the Babesia on a blood smear. Um, 
but that wasn't the end of this case. So this wasn't just another pit bull with Babesia. So interestingly, this dog had um, been attacked by two other pit bulls um, prior to becoming sick. He had surgery to repair lacerations. After surgery, he became anemic. He was not anemic before then. Um, he had an abdominal ultrasound where they found nodules in his stomach. They were worried he had a bleeding ulcer and his spleen was very enlarged. So they were actually concerned that he had a splenic neoplasia. He's an older dog. They thought he had splenic cancer. They went to surgery and did endoscopy. They biopsied the stomach, which were benign. Um, and they took out his spleen, which was, you know, a basically benign lesions, a combination of lymphoid hyperplasia and extramedullary hematopoiesis. Um, but this is very important because if you don't have a spleen, just like in people, it is really difficult to get rid of your babesia. But the things that looked at, that I look at this case, he became anemic after a dog bite. That's unusual. His spleen became enlarged after a dog bite in, in dogs. That's unusual. They took his spleen out. Honestly, that was a mistake. Um, once now, our 80% chance of clearing this infection goes down to almost zero when you don't have a spleen. Um, and atovacone and azithromycin is not perfect. So these are the treatments that we use. Um, in these cases, when we have an inability to clear the parasite, I think that these treatments are babesiostatic, not babesiocidal, and you need the immune system to help clear up the remnants. Um, the remnants that survive frequently have mutations which make them resistant to incytochrome B, resistant to atovacone. Um, this is a uh, sequencing chromatogram. This is actually a feline pathogen, but it kind of demonstrates what we see and what we think happens. So we think that you're, during initial infection, you have primarily wild types susceptible to atovaquone. Um, after treatment, you may select for resistant pathogens, um, and then we never see a return to the wild type. So this is a classic serial finding in dogs that fail atovaquone and azithromycin. Um, We've been studying this now for, I don't know, 15 years or so. Um, this is pretty well documented. I just saw some papers that came out, I think in the past several months about Babesia microti having a tobacone resistance, similar mutations. What did we do? Um, we treated him with multiple, multiple antibiotics for months and months, and he did respond. So I say, even though I occasionally have to quack, I'm a pretty fancy duck. So I gave him lots of of drugs and he got better. This case is interesting. This dog is not anemic, not thrombocytopenic, but has high globulins. Um, most of you would probably say, I'm not gonna treat, test this dog for Babesia, it's not anemic. And nobody else wanted to either. Interestingly, this dog was one of the pit bulls that had attacked bones, the dog that got splenectomized. Um, so this was one of his housemates, and he had a hyperglobulinemia, evidence of chronic infection, hypoalbuminemia. He did not have severe proteinuria as evidenced by a urine protein creatinine ratio, um, and he was infected with Babesia. So these types of cases make me learn to think about the exceptions to the rule. If you only test patients that are anemic for Babesia, I guarantee you, you will miss some patients that are infected with Babesia. Um, and, you know, so atypical presentations, we recognize them fairly frequently in veterinary medicine. I, I suspect, and based on what I've read in the human literature, um, clinicians' ability to detect atypical presentations is not that great. Last couple things. Um, <laughs> if you asked me 20 years ago, does Babesia cause kidney failure? and protein losing nephropathy. As an expert, I would have said, absolutely not. Well, guess what? I was wrong. Um, the first case is a case where the veterinarian suspected Lyme nephritis. They sent a panel to be tested by our laboratory. The dog was negative for Lyme, did not have Lyme nephritis, but was positive for Babesia. The dog was treated for Babesia and had complete resolution of its proteinuria and azotemia. And we've subsequently published that before. So. This is just another, <laughs> I'm constantly humbled and reminded that there's more that I, know, more the, that I don't know than what I know. Um, and you must be aware and look for those atypical presentations. 
nowadays, this is what we're working on now. Um, we are sequencing the genomes of multiple Babesia species for comparative genomics so that we can understand their pathogenicity. Um, we believe this will have applications to both veterinary and human medicine, where we will look for a new vaccine, drug targets, et cetera. Um, my take-home messages are there's a lot of Babesia on this planet, um, more than we know about. Mostly they stick to their host but they will jump across species. I guarantee you, if you're not looking for Babesia, you're not gonna find it. Um, and the bad news is, if you do find it, it can be difficult to treat because um, they're pretty resistant and living in those red cells can make them um, have a pretty privileged site to hide from, from drugs and the immune system. And with that, I will answer any questions.